What's going on guys? Welcome back to episode 3 of the Prattling Pigskin, the official podcast of UK Pigskin. In this week's episode, I've got the one and only Jeff Reinbold joining me all the way from sunny Hawaii. And it's not one to be missed. We talk all things Black Lives Matter movement, Colin Kaepernick and even NFL Europe. So without further ado, if you've not already, get yourself a brew and enjoy the show. Kick things off. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be joined by one of the most well-known faces in the NFL landscape, especially on the UK side of things, Jeff Reinbold. Jeff Reinbold, how are you? I am outstanding, my good man. How are things back in England? Yeah, very well, thank you. Apart from the uh, tropical storm, which you don't believe me that we've just had. Uh, but other than that, all is well, thank you. It's not a, no, no, no. It's not a tropical storm. You yeah. might have got a storm, but a tropical storm happens in the tropics. And I've been to England now, you remember, and England is nowhere near the tropics. We had a couple of uh, lightning flashes, that's enough for us. Anyway, what will kick things off, because I've got a lot to get through with you today. Um, but we'll start with the uh, current issues in the NFL landscape. Obviously, I spoke about this with Jason Bell last week, the Black Lives Matter movement, something very close to his heart. Um, what are your just thoughts and feelings about everything that's going off in the America? Well, it's not just America, it's over here now as well. What are your thoughts? Well, you know what, that's a right there, that question we could spend all week talking about, but I think just the gist of it is, you know, trying to be a positive, positive person and try and find the good in all situations. And I think that uh, what happened in Minnesota with George Floyd uh, was the, you know, was the proverbial camel, the uh, straw that broke the camel's back where enough, enough is enough. And this is a thing that has been going on in, in America for way too long and not just America. And I think this is, that's important that everybody understands that this isn't America's problem. This is the world's problem and uh, racism and all that comes with it is, uh, you know, it's not, it's not just in one pocket of the world or one place in the world or one situation. And, and, uh, but I think it's now because of the media that we have, this stuff's been going on for a long time, but now people are seeing it sometimes for the first time and in real shocking detail. When you have a policeman put his knee on a man's neck and basically snuff out his life on live on television, I mean, that wakes you up to the fact that, hey, maybe, maybe this is a deeper problem than, you know, I, I appreciate it. And I'm hopeful that that has been the reaction of the commissioner when you know the commissioner really sided on the on the with the right in the past and it's not a political issue it's a right and wrong issue but when colin kaepernick knelt and the commissioner you know went on record as saying that we're not going to allow that we don't want that you know it's it's not nobody's disrespecting flag it's never about the flag what happened was politicians hijacked the message and made it about the flag and made it about patriotism it's it's classic uh, damage control. What do you do if your your side of the issue is hurt? You immediately attack back, and that's what they did. And America bought it. And sadly, all that all that had has done is just created more time for more more of these kinds of things to take place. So I'm hopeful that now with you know, the players speaking out like they are with the public outcry that there is with the commissioner apparently, you know, backing the players and their ability to, to, to say what they feel about issues that are close to their heart. I think those are all positive things. And I hope the impetus now takes us further down that road. It's a long, hard road, man. We ain't, I mean, it, you ain't going to erase centuries of this stuff in weeks. And I think it'll be interesting to see how, you know, where we are a month from now, whether this still is as hot button an issue as it is. I hope it is. You have just, uh, based on what you said there, you back the thought, the process of some players kneeling off the top of my head. Josh Jacobs, Baker Mayfield, OBJ said today that, he, that they, they'll kneel. I, I feel like we'll see a lot of players kneeling. But do you think that could cause a divide in the locker room? Because you'll, I presume there'll be some players standing and some players kneeling. 
Well, this is a really interesting thing you're talking about because, um, you know, the, what happened in New Orleans when Breeze said, I'll never, you know, back anybody kneeling during the national anthem. And then the huge backlash that he got from that inside Malcolm Jenkins, guys inside the team. Thomas Morstead, who is their all pro punter, is uh, one of my kids. And so I had Thomas on uh, Coffee with the Coach last Wednesday, and we talked about that in detail. And he, you know, Drew has since gone back and, you know, apologized for his words and, and you know, explained that he didn't really understand. And I asked Thomas pointedly, how do you think that you guys are going to be able to deal with this inside your locker room? Because a locker room, you know, so much of winning is, you know, beyond the physical part of the game, beyond the X's and O's of the game, beyond the schematic part of the game. It's, you know, the kind of attitude. They use the word culture, and I don't like it because it's an overused word, but what actually the, the temperature of your football team is like during the course of the season. And it's tough because you've got 65 guys from 65 different backgrounds and all the, it's hard to all be pulling in the same direction. And so I asked Thomas pointedly about that. And he said, they had already, the saints have already gone uh, to the point of in their zoom conversations that they have during the week, you know, cause we're in that coaching sessions part now they're addressing the issue inside their quote locker room, which right now is, you know, like it'd be as if you and I were in the locker room and, and uh, Drew has apologized to his teammates. And Thomas said that, you know, he feels very strongly that Drew's sincere in his apology and that it has the potential. If it, if it's done the right way, it has the potential to draw a team even closer, but it can also be a, a divisive wedge in a, in a football team. And that's, that's part of the, real coaching that goes on. We always think about coaches as guys that just give the players an assignment or an X and O or help them with a technique or a fundamental, but it's much more than that. It's really much more than that. And I think that we'll find out who the truly great coaches are in this environment. It's interesting you touched on Breeze there. That's one thing that I probably asked last week, but still obviously it's come out since he's apologized. Used to, I, I can't see, personally I can't see that relationship in that locker room regardless of apologies and whatnot Michael Thomas has come out saying that's my quarterback blah 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 surely relationships are some within the dressing room there are irreparable well I think, I think there's been some obviously there's damage done you know you you, you hear the things that that Malcolm Jenkins said, you hear the things that now Ed Reed's not a teammate of his, but Ed Reed's a, a guy that particularly the young players pay a great deal of attention to because he was such a great player. And, you know, to come out and, and actually call Drew Brees a sucker, which is a, you know, in the vernacular of the player, that's that, you know, that's, that's a pretty strong mm -hmm. statement. Yeah. Um, obviously there's going to be some damage there and it's not going to be uh the same scenario, the same vibe when they all get together. But I also know this about being, and I've been in 30 years of pro locker rooms. They are very forgiving as long as, uh, as long as they feel that that apology is genuine and that the player who apologizes demonstrates with his actions that he really is contrite that he really does, you know, apologize for what he said and did. You know, Drew Brees is one of the most active guys in the New Orleans community, right? He's, he and his wife have given over $5 million to trying to upgrade conditions in New Orleans. New Orleans is a beautiful city. It's a fantastic city. But it is one of the, quote, black cities in America where the population, black population is larger than the white population. And, you know, he's done a tremendous amount of work in that city. And I'd hate to see the work that he's done um, go for naught. And I think he's done a, an, an awful lot of work, work in their locker room. They have a very – Thomas will tell you this. They have a very strong locker room, very strong locker room. And that they have, you know, a number of leaders, not just the guys with the C on their chest as captains like Thomas is, but a number of guys in that locker room. So he's going to have some work to do. He's going to have some fences to mend. He's going to have some, you know – and with some of the players, they probably won't forget. 
but I think they'll be able to put it behind themselves when they go play. Because again, here's the re <laughs> you want the real truth? The real truth is there's all kinds of guys in an NFL locker room. And if anybody thinks that they're all one kind of guy, there's racist white guys and racist black guys. There's gay guys. There's straight guys. There's all kinds of people in there, right? It's, it's, it's a microcosm of society. It's 65, 70. You're talking about when you start talking about coaches and coaching staff and, and people that really touch the football team. I'm not talking about the administrators. I'm talking about the guys that touch the football team. There's probably 125 people. And obviously, they're not all going to be the same and not all going to be from the same background or with the same morals or with the same beliefs or any of those other things. But football, and, and this is why I think it's the greatest team sport, you have to get rid of all that shit for three hours on Sunday or you're not going to, you're not going to function very well as a yeah. football team. The lesson that can come from that is awesome if we'll take it. But if we just get caught up in the score at the end of the game, right, the quote bottom line, let me tell you something, the bottom line ain't the bottom line, right? For the owners, the bottom line is what? How much money they make, right? For the players, you know, the bottom line, what, what, they, what you perceive as the bottom line when you're playing, when you're 15, 20 years down the road from, from, from your playing days, you'll realize that it's the relationships that are the bottom line, not the wins and losses, right? And that's, again, what people who have never been in a locker room like that lose sight of. And frankly, sometimes even the people in the locker room lose sight of it when they're going through it, yeah. right? Because I will bet you that whenever Bill Belichick steps aside and he'll be the winningest coach in NFL history with more Super Bowl titles and all of that, if you ask him what's the most important thing about his career, he'll tell you it's the relationships he had with the people he worked with, right? And that's, again, the great thing that comes out of football. Well, from Drew Brees and uh, one quarterback to another quarterback, very, again, very relate, related to the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, Colin Kaepernick. One, do you think he will, does, well, do you think he deserves a team for one? And two, do you think you will get a team? I think th this is a really complex question, right? And you're, you're asking me, if you're asking me, do I think he is owed something by the NFL? I say on, on, a, couple of, on a couple of levels, I do really believe that. Number one, I think he's owed by the commissioner a personal apology. That's the minimal that he's owed. But then again, if... And with what the commissioner said, what I read into the, what the commissioner said was basically he was blackballed because of his stance previously. And if that's the case, then you denied a guy an opportunity to work. Now you have a financial ability to, you have, you have a financial responsibility to make him whole, right? I don't know what his contract was. I don't know. And that's four years ago, right? But he's lost an awful lot of money because of his stance publicly, if in fact he was blackballed, which is what I read through the commissioner's statement, right? And Doug Williams, I guess, has come out this week and said that they thought about, they thought about hiring him and or signing him in with the Redskins. And his, his kneeling was an issue that they said, now nah, we're not gonna go that way. Well, you, you can't deny a man, this is, this is a free speech. You cannot deny a man the right to work based upon what he espouses what he believes in, right? Kneeling on the sideline, that, that, you can't do it. So obviously then there's a financial issue that the NFL needs to look at to make him whole. The third part is a little more complex and that's the football part of it. Does he truly want to play? That's the first question, right? Because if he doesn't want to play, what's the point, right? Mm -hmm. Two, if in fact he does want to play, then is he good enough, legitimately good enough, to be on somebody's team, to help somebody's roster? Now, you may decide, even if he's not physically, he's lost as much as some guys can lose in four years without playing, it's very tough to come. I mean, Solomon Wilcott said the same thing. You gotta understand, when you take a year off, it's hard. You take four years off, 
it's incredibly hard to come back. So, so if he's lost some of the skill, but yet a team feels like as their third quarterback or a backup quarterback, his leadership, his experience, all, all of those things are of value to that team, then I think they should sign him. I don't think anybody should sign him just to make him uh, or just to make themselves look good because that's patronizing him. And I, and I, I don't think he would want to be signed for that reason. Do you understand what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. I think really, really involved question. Do I think he is, do I think he is uh, deserving of things from the NFL? Yes. Apology, financial remuneration, and an opportunity if he truly wants to play. And again, every player will tell you, all you want is an opportunity. Now, I got to believe that based on some of the third quarterbacks I've seen in this league, <laughs> that he's still good enough to play for somebody if he wants to. I think you've, you've touched on basically my next question there. And it is, if somebody does pick him up now, I think there's going to be the question or at least – the take from some people that people about somewhat the a franchise has only picked him up because of what's happened now. So regardless of whether they truly believe he's good enough, I feel like there's always going to be people now that think they only did that because of what's happened. And I feel like for the for whoever picks him up and for Colin himself, I feel like it's a bit of a lose lose situation because I feel like people, like you said there, will look at it as more of a patronising thing than anything else. I don't think, like I say, essentially, if somebody could pick him up, somebody could pick him up and think he is more than good enough to be at least a backup. But will people truly believe that, even if they come out and say that in the press? You know what? I, I don't know, because, and really in the end, in the end, it, it really doesn't matter, because... The only person that has to really answer to that is the team that, that signs him, right? There will be Colin Kaepernick haters that are going to say, regardless, he only got signed because that team's trying to make themselves look good or whatever. They're patronizing him. And they'll have that opinion because they're not going to change their opinion. And they'll be racist and going to say, don't give that guy a job. And then they're going, to people, they're going to be people completely on the other end of the spectrum that are going to say he, he deserves an opportunity to play. He, des- or he deserves a job or he should be signed. I don't go that far to the, quote, left, if you will, because I, I think that does a disservice to the game, right? And the game screws it up bad enough, right, without us doing more. I, I, like I say, if the guy – truly wants to play and if he's good enough to play and I got to believe he can be a third quarterback somewhere in this league then I think he should be given the opportunity to do that that becomes now football's choice oh another choice of football another quarterback which you know is coming next how is my question actually is how has Cam Newton not got a job well I think I think again there's there's factors here right and I'm not Again, I'm, I'm trying to give you, as a football man, what, I, what I've seen. I think there's some really unique, unique factors in Cam's case. One, he's coming off an injury. Now, we just went through a period of time where you could not physical guys, right, because of COVID-19. Mm. So teams that might have been interested in Cam lost all that time where you were never going to sign him until – you had a chance to physical him because if, if you, you know, you remember what happened with Brockers where yeah. the Rams lost him and then they got him back because he failed a physical. Well, I think it was about a month almost. They didn't think that they thought he was playing somewhere else. Yeah, and, then the Ravens, sudden, yeah. and then all of a sudden Baltimore got a chance to physical him and he failed and he, and it so it voided the deal and s- sent him back. I was talking to my agent, who is Cameron Wake's agent, and one of the things that's holding up Cameron Wake getting signed is the fact that teams want to bring him in and work him out and see what he's got left. And don't tell me that Cameron Wake couldn't be a situational pass rusher in the league right now. Just look at what he did last year in the reps that he had. 
at Tennessee. So he's on hold like Cam Newton's on hold because of this whole pandemic thing. Now, Cam is a little more of a on, – on one hand, you got a guy, Cameron Wake, and another guy, you got Cameron Newton, right? And they're completely perceived as diff, different players by the general public. Both great players, both pro bowlers, Cameron Wake, nice guy, Cam Newton, for whatever reason, to polarizing of a figure, right? And then let's be honest, that plays part in it, right? And I don't think it's a racial thing because we're talking about two black athletes, right? I don't think it's a racial thing with Cam Newton. I think it's a question of as an organization and something that they would have to sit down with him and, and it, you're talking about face-to-face -face communication, right? Are you comfortable coming in and being a backup to start? Which Jameis Winston made expressly clear to New Orleans right away. Right. I'll come and be a backup. I'll, I want to I want to learn for a year. I want to sit behind Breeze. I want to learn. I want to learn Sean Payton's system. And I'm, that'll be the jump start of my career. I don't know. And I don't have any way of knowing. And neither do you or any of anybody. Anybody that says they know doesn't know what teams feel about Cam's sincerity in that situation. I know what Cam has done, in my opinion, is all the right things. He said, I'll come in as a backup. I can, I can start as a backup, but I want to be a starter. Hey, everybody wants to be a starter. That's what you want a guy to think. And I've seen uh, all kinds of stuff of him working out that makes you say, that shoulder looks pretty good to me. But we're talking about a guy, you got to remember, at the quarterback position the, where your ability to throw the football is paramount coming off of a bad, bad surgery. So do I think he'll play in the league? Yes. Do I think he'll get signed prior to training camps? Yes. Would I be surprised if he didn't? Yes. Is he as good as a, a, a number of starting quarterbacks in this league? Yes. So those are all, that's just my take on it. I like it. I like it a lot. I'd like, I, I hope... I hope. You're right, and we do get to see Cam Newton next year for someone, anyway. He's a, he's a phenomenal player. You know, and it's funny with Cam because I, let me tell you a Cam Newton story. My son, my youngest son, Pico, is a, like, he, he's sick about the Panthers. I mean, he is, like, as a kid, had, you know, Panther baits. He was, I mean, he's a Carolina Panther huge fan. Huge. So, when I was living in Dallas, the Panthers came to Houston to play the Texans. And I called a friend of mine at the Texans and I said, hey, listen, I would like to bring my son down to see a game. He got us two tickets and he got us two passes to go on the field before the game. So I'm down on the field and Cole and I are walking around and, you know, I mean, he's starstruck. He's, he's 12 years old at that time. And he's looking around in that beautiful stadium and then all – all of a sudden, I see Ron Rivera down in the tunnel where the Panthers dress. So I said, come on, I'll introduce you to Ron Rivera. So I took my son down there, and we're talking to Ron Rivera. And I look, and out of the tunnel, I see, I see the shapes of bodies moving in the tunnel as the players coming out to warm up. And the first guy is Cam. And, like, I was impressed with him physically. I mean, I was like, oh, God, that guy looks like a tight end, not a quarterback. But he goes out and he starts warming up his throwing drills. And we got done with Ron and, and I said, just go on the field, just, you know, because he, he, he could see the way he saw the way my son looked at My son was like this. I walked by, right, like every little kid would be. He said, Ron said, just go on the field and, you know, let him, let him watch him warm up. So Cam was over there with the center and it was warming up. And – he he's a free spirit. I mean, he's a like he came out of the tunnel doing his Superman thing and the whole deal, right? <laughs> he's fun. And my son stood five feet away from him, watched him throw. And Cam Newton held a conversation with him for ten minutes. And like like my my son was like that 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 that, that. you know he couldn't talk. He was <laughs> yeah. That's the kind yeah. of Cam Newton story that never seems to get out there. 
You know, he was so good to my son. He had no reason to be. There was nothing good. I, mean, I couldn't help Cam Newton in any way, shape, or form. I'm, you know, and it's right before a game where other guys would have just brushed him off and say, hey, kid, get out of here. But as Cam was warming up, they, they held a conversation like that. And, you know, I mean, I can't, I can't describe to you what that did to my son. Yeah. You know, so there's a story that you never hear about Cam. And, you know, that's why I don't get a lot of that stuff. Well, I think even me being a 25-year-old man, I think I'd be a bit like, baby, baby, if Cam Newton tries to talk to me. So I completely <laughs> understand your, uh, your son there. I tell you what, I, what I'd have got like that is if I was playing safety and he got out of the got out of the pocket and I had to come tackle him. <laughs> I don't know. I'm telling you, he is a big man. <laughs> right. So from one fun guy uh, in Cam Newton to yourself, Jeff, you're a fun guy. You're uh, the way you interact with fans is brilliant. And uh, let's talk a bit about you, shall we? I've got literally, I have pages and pages of notes of your career because. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, you've been coaching for nearly 40 years now, professionally. Yeah, I started when I was seven. Uh, you've coached in the... You started when you were seven? No, I just... Because somebody's going to do the math and find out how old I am. <laughs> you started... No, that's cool. You started when you were seven, we'll go with that. Uh, so you've coached Canadian Football League, college football, NFL Europe, which is, which is that's what I'm, one I'm very intrigued about. NFL Europe, it disbanded in, is it 2004, 2007, the NFL Europe disbanded? 2007, yeah. 2007. I'm pretty, it means the NFL Europe, it's before my time of watching American football. So just tell me about NFL Europe. What was the whole process of NFL Europe? What was it and what was the aim for it to be? Okay, well, the league was came about every commissioner this is interesting stuff really commissioners are like presidents or prime ministers or kings they all want a legacy they all want to have something that they're remembered for if you go back in the history of the national football league pete roselle was the quote first powerful commissioner of the national football league and he was known for, for televi getting the game to television right because before, before the NFL, and I'm kind of a historian, a football historian. I, I apologize for this noise. That's uh, okay. I've got a dog too. Don't worry. <laughs> and um, you know, before 1960, and even into the early 60s, college football in America was much bigger than the NFL. Much, much bigger. And then there were a couple of kind of kind of games game defining games right? and those games were on television and then television the NFL took the game to television and NFL films was really really important and all that right where they filmed they, they had never done anything no pro sport did anything like NFL films did and and um, you know that's one of the Steve Sable's father that's one of the greatest things that have ever happened in the National Football League when he made he, he he was a home photographer, right? And he and his son would, went to the Eagle games and sat up in the stands and shot movies, eight, eight millimeter movies, 16 millimeter movies of the Eagle games. And then they marketed that and then the idea caught on. And the next thing you know, they're shooting in slow motion, 60 millimeter, multiple cameras, all the stuff today. And the game blew up because it was so far, they were so far ahead of the curve. And mm. Roselle endorsed that, where other leagues said, no, we don't need that. We don't depend on that. That's, that's fluff. He, Pete Roselle realized that that's how the game could grow. Then Mr. Tagliabu took over from Roselle, and he wanted the globalization of the game to be his legacy. Baseball, you know, has, has had players from Holland, Italy, all the Caribbean countries, Japan, Korea, it's a global sport. Basketball, global sport. You see, you know, great players from Spain, from Europe, from everywhere. Ma Yao Ming from China. I mean, so they thought that 
they could take the game to Europe initially because of there was already an indigenous game in Europe because of what had transpired with American servicemen after World War II. They played in Germany, they played in England, they played in Belgium, they played in Holland. Wherever there were bases, there was football. And so they brought teams to Europe. It was, it was alive for two years, and then it originally started as there was an American division and a European division. There were teams in Birmingham, Memphis, a number, number of cities in the United States. Then that shut down for two years, and they came back with only European teams. And the idea was it was going to be a way to globalize the game, grow the game, grow the merchant, because the NFL is about money. Let's make no mistake about it. Right? It's a bottom line business, right? And their bottom line is making money. Uh, they looked at all the television sets in Europe. They looked at the fact that England, England's, you know, this, I, I was privy to some of this information. England ranks, I think, in the top five in the world of countries that spend money on sport. You know, buying jerseys, going to games, all that stuff per capita. So they came to England and they came to Germany because there, there were service bases there and they thought they could get fans just by American servicemen come. Long story short, they also wanted to develop football players. And as the, the league had to go every two years to get funding from the National Football League to run. And so as the league eventually evolved, the one place, there were two places where it was successful. Number one was developing football players. Because if you look at, and everybody points to Kurt Warner, but I could give you Leroy Glover, I could give you uh, Adam Vinatieri, I could give you numerous, I mean numerous, way too, way too many to talk about in one deal, guys whose their, their careers would have never happened had they not had an opportunity to play in NFL. So Europe then go back to their Dante Hall, I mean on and on and on and on. And the spinoff that they didn't know that they were going to get, like the, the synchronicity of it, was that every official who made the leap from college football to the NFL now had a place that they had to go to officiate the pro game. Because I'm going to tell you something. There is no comparison. I don't talk – you can talk LSU, Alabama, SC, Notre Dame, Michigan, any of them. There is no comparison between what happens on a pro football field and what happens on a college football field. Coach Vermeil told us – used to say it this way. College football is a game they play on Saturday afternoon. The boys play on Saturday afternoon. Pro football is a war played by grown men on Sunday. And that's the best way I've ever heard it described. It is it's not even close to the same game. Uh, so trainers, young coaches, it started to be a league where you could develop players and coaches, right? Mm -hmm. And then, as times is the case, and, and I'm, and I'm going to write a book when I'm finished coaching, and I'm going to really detail what actually happened to NFL Europe. There were a group of owners that were greedy, and they had to spend – every team spent just a little over a million dollars to keep the league up and running. And they felt that their money was better spent in other things. A million – let's say it's a million and a half, and I know it wasn't that high. Yeah. A million and a half. They waste – 15 times that much money on signing guys that can't play. Right. So, but those guys were very strong owners and commissioner. Uh, the commissioner, the new commissioner now Tagaboo leaves. Right. And we get our new commissioner. And initially we had thought that he was on our side and as a, as a new commissioner, as a younger commissioner, and Commissioner Goodell got hammered by, the, by these old, frontline, real conservative owners. And we lost the vote, and they shut the league. And it's been the biggest mistake they've ever made, the biggest mistake they've ever made. Because not only did players get developed, fans got developed, the game got grown, officials got developed, filmers got developed, equipment – Personnel guys, everybody. What is – see, here's, here's what people have got to understand. 
we always talk about the top level of the food chain, the problem at the top. Well, if there's a problem at the top, it usually means that there's something missing in the developmental process, mm. right? It's just like, it's like growing in your garden. If you're not getting tomatoes out of your, you don't all of a sudden go eight weeks after you plant it and say, we got a problem here, right? If you don't water it, if you don't, if you don't feed it, if you don't help it grow. Well, shit, why, do, why are we having all this with diversity right now in players, in coaches, in front office people? I'll tell you why. Because there's no place for those guys to develop. And you've got a, you've got a win now mentality in the league. It's not about developing coaches. It's about win now, right? And so what are guys going to do? They're going to go, they're going to stay with guys that they know, right? I under, I get that. I get that. From a coaching standpoint, I will tell you this. I, I, I can't think of one time where I've ever seen a guy say, don't hire that guy because he's black. I'm not hiring that guy because he's a black guy or a Mexican guy or an Indian guy or whatever he is, right? I've seen a trillion examples of, I don't know him. I can't, I don't know if I, because you know what happens? This is the most, one of the most pressure packed, highly intense, uns, it, you know, there's no security in it. And it's paranoia run rampant. And if you've waited your whole life, think about your own situation. If you'd waited your whole life for a job and you fought your ass off to get there and you're finally there, and now you've got to go put people around you, the, the guys that teach about leadership, they're going to tell you, well, you better get the best you can get and you better get guys that will challenge you. And, and, you know, but you know what happens? Guys don't do that. Because what, what's, this is the reality of coaching, right? That coordinator wants your job, right? And that coordinator feels that that position coach wants his job. And so there's all kinds of ass covering going on, all kinds of layers and layers of it. And then and there's also nepotism involved too. How many coaches' sons are coaching in the National Football League? There's a ton of them, ton of them. Now, it doesn't mean those guys don't, can't coach. It just means that they got opportunities because their father got them that opportunity, which is what happens in business. I get it, right? But now you look at the top of the curve and you say, we've got four minority coaches, if you count Ron Rivera, who's Hispanic as a minority. Well, where's the problem? The problem is way down below you where you're not developing young guys. The NFL does a thing, and they beat their chest about it. It's called the Quarterback Symposium. It's two days of uh, some of the best coaches in, in the NFL come together, and it's, it'll be done on virtual reality this, this year because of the COVID situation. But for two days, they bring in the brightest young guys, and they te teach about how to build a staff, da 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 all that kind of stuff, right, which is great. Two days. Two days. You can't, I mean, I read, I read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Tipping Point. It's 10,000 hours it takes to gain expertise, right? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna develop that guy in two days? You're, you're kidding yourself. It needs to be an ongoing process. And until it is, it's going to be an issue. And then you add on top of it, then layer on top of it, the racial thing. Because I'd be lying to you if, I, if, it, if it, when I'm talking about up at the stratosphere, right? So it's a challenge and it's a challenge. They got to direct, they need to address at the bottom and so that the bottom grows strong. So the top is there because when you lose, think about this, <clears throat> when you lose Lovey Smith, right. And you lose Tony Dungy, right. Who are you replacing them with? Right. Those guys are, those guys were complete. Those guys were Tony Dungy, played in the league, and then was a long-time assistant in the league. He learned how to become a head coach. Lovey was a long – didn't play in the league, but he was a long-time assistant for Tony in Tampa before he got an opportunity to go as a coordinator to St. Louis. Well, when you take that kind of experience out at the top and you can't replace it or you don't replace it, 
you're going to have a you're going to have a problem. You're going to have what we have today. And you know, hopefully that. I mean, we got some big ass brains in New York. They got more Ivy League educations in New York. In, and I talk about New York. I'm talking about the NFL office. Okay, they got guys from Harvard. All these high powered academic guys. All these degrees. Figure it out. It ain't that hard. Do you think? Um... Well, do you think a potential to bring back NFL Europe is there? And do you think if they did that, well, you've touched on it a lot there. Do you think it would it would help with the things that are, the problems that we see in the game and in just wider society because it is there as it's there as like a learning curve, isn't it? Yeah. Now, let me say this, okay? And again, I don't want to I don't I don't want to write my book right here on your show, but. <laughs> it has to be managed in a different way than it was managed before. Right. Because when, when we came back, right. In 90, cause I was part of it when we came back in 94 and um, if you look at the head coaches, the guys who were head coaches at that time, um, Galen Hall, Jack Picknell, Dick Curl. Uh, initially, it was uh, a guy by the name of Larry Kuharik in Scotland. Um, I'm trying to, there was one more. Oh, and a uh, gentleman who was head coach in England, New England, or with the uh, London Monarchs. Of those guys, there was one minority, right? And that was the head coach in, in London. Um, and Kuharik was an arena football league coach whose brother was the GM, GM of the Saints. Coach, coach Bignell, who was my college coach, had never coached in pro football. Galen had never coached in pro, pro football. He was a great football guy. I didn't mean they were bad football coaches, but they were, and all of those guys, all of those guys, we're old guys, so they weren't gonna they weren't gonna go anywhere from that job. They were in their fifties and sixties. It'd be like hiring me, right? And they weren't gonna go to the National Football League and be head coaches. No way, no way, no way. But they were that you know there was guys. It was somebody taking care of a buddy that you know giving a guy an. What needed to be were young, dynamic guys in those things. Bobby Hampton was the, was the initial guy in, um, in London. And then he didn't make it through the first season. Um, but even at that, even in the hirings, the way the, the league was structured initially, you know, there, it wasn't, okay, we've got a young guy, like, let's say we got a young coordinator in the NFL and he, we're, we're going to groom him to be a head coach. This is how we're going to groom him. We're going to send him to NFL Europe. We're going to give him the opportunity to be a head coach, to run his own program, right? That would have been revolutionary. Mm -hmm. But, again, if you go down that road, then you have to realize that the head coaches in NFL Europe at that time were making just north of $100,000, right? An assistant coach at that time in the National Football League, if he was a coordinator, was probably making a quarter of a million dollars. So – there would have to be some way that you could remunerate those guys in such a way because again, in, in its essence, NFL Europe was run um, very, very t on a very tight ship. They were okay. constantly trying to save money, constantly trying to save money. Some, and actually some great things came out of that. First time we ever practiced in training camp had two practices right back to back to one another. And the reason that they did that, that's one last time they got to hire the bus to go to the practice field. That's one last time they got to tape an ankle. That's one, that's X expenses, right? And then boom, everybody saw, well, that's a pretty good idea. And people are doing it now in the National Football League. But it was a, it was like radical at the time, you know, but it was one of the good things that came out of the league. In short then, Jeff, will NFL Europe ever return? Yes or no? I don't know if it'll, I don't know if it'll return in its in what it was, but I, I do know this, and I will say this without a hesitation: the NFL needs 
a developmental league. There are far more players who can play in the NFL than do play in the NFL, right? And so if you just went down, just take that list of guys that we just talked about, right? And you say, where would the Chiefs have been with Coach Vermeil with no Dante Hall, right? You know, how successful would that Saint, those Saints teams be without Leroy Glover? You know, I mean, it, you could go on and on and on and on and on about guys that, you know, Kurt Warner, if Kurt Warner's not Kurt Warner and, and you know, Trent Green goes down when Rodney Harrison hits him in preseason and there's no Trent, there, there's no, uh, you know, there's no Kurt Warner. Do you think that they would have won the Super Bowl? I'll give you money. I was with that. I, I was there in training camp. I, I didn't. They had no chance. They had no chance. Even though they had Oz Hakeem and they had all these great players, yeah. somebody's got to get the ball to them. And Kurt had been, already been cut by the Packers. He played arena football. And, but he had spent those 10 games in Amsterdam, 11, I think, because I think they went to the championship game. They, those 11 games of starting against – good competition, higher level competition was what he needed to go back and win a job in the NFL. I think the, uh, the, on, the only recent thing we have of that is the XFL actually, which is again, ceased to uh, exist. Whether that will come back, I don't know, but there's obviously the NFL have handpicked players from them ever since they've ceased to exist. It's like PJ Walker and I hope he gets a shot in the NFL because I watched the, quite a bit of the XFL when it was on and he looked a real talent and that a similar situation to Kurt Warner, he could be a real, real talent in the NFL. He's a, he's a mobile yeah, I mean, quarterback. You, so you can take you can take any team you want to take in the league, and you can say, okay, look where the players come from, and they come from a myriad of different ways. And most of them do come from the draft. But there's a whole bunch of free agents that make it. There's a whole bunch of guys that have had guys go up to Canada and play in the CFL and come back, Hall of Famers. I mean, Joe Theismann, Doug Flutie, Warren Moon, Cameron Wake. I, I mean, I could go on and on and on and on, right? But those guys got a chance to develop because they went to some place where there was another game being played. If there's no other game in town, that's great for the 32 owners who are making that money. But it's not great for your product, and it's not great for the game, and it's not great for minority hiring, and it's not great for a lot of things. So greed can kill an organization. Let me, before, well, before we end and before uh, you write your, your entire book on my show, like you said yourself, <laughs> uh, let me hit you with my uh, five quick fire cues before we go. They're not, well, I say right, now, what's the rules? What's the rules in this game? I, I don't like playing games. I don't know the rules. So you got to give me the rules. No rules other than uh, you got to answer honestly as possible. Okay, I, I, I'm never gonna, listen. I get myself in trouble all the time for being for doing that, so don't have to worry about that. <laughs> okay, no worries. First one, then who's 2020 all all basically early takes. So 2020 worst record in the NFL. Who's having it? Who's taking that number one pick the next year? Worst record in the NFL in 2020. Wow, I'm gonna say. Uh, wow, that's a that that is an interesting one. That is really an interesting one. Who's the bottom it, feeder? In, Detroit Lions. The, the the interesting one with that is obviously very early takes again. The I've not actually heard Detroit Lions as one being said, but the interesting take I take I say there is Trevor Lawrence is everyone's number one pick, so it seems. However. Would the Detroit Lions take Trevor Lawrence? I don't know. I mean, obviously, staff. I don't know. Made. You know, and, and it's it's the same thing. So you, you say that the other team that I thought of right off the top of my head. And this great discussion was the Bengals. You know. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm going to tell you what. It's this is the greatness of the of the National Football League. If and you better not say Leeds, by the way. But <laughs> let's say Leeds Leeds goes up and somebody gets relegated, right? I think anybody that has watched 
any premiership soccer at all would say that they could tell who the bottom four teams in the league were going to be. Mm. Every You know who it is, right? Yeah. You can't do that in the National Football League because the Lions have Matthew Stafford, and he can win games for you, right? Now, if they lose him, we, can all, we also saw what the Lions can be last year too, right? Cincinnati, what's Joe Burrow's going to mean to that? What's Joe Burrow going to mean to that team? You know, what's another year under that coaching staff going to mean to that team? So, yeah, you'd say, well, those, those teams are going to struggle, but how many times have we seen a team go from, in their division from worst to first? So it's, that's a really hard question. That's harder probably than saying who's going to win the Super Bowl. That's my next question then, Jeff. Go for it. It was actually my next question. <laughs> so who's going to win the Super Bowl? <laughs> Ah, uh, I'm going to say Kansas City. I tell you, they got so many good players, and they did such a great job of keeping good players this offseason. Three interviews I've done, every person has said Kansas City. Interesting. No, I, think, I, think that's, I, think that's, I think that's the way most people believe, really. If they can, again, there's so much to it. You know, Patrick's got to stay healthy. You know, they got to be hungry. You know, I, I think Andy does a great job, so I know they'll be well coached and ready. Number three, then, league MVP next year. Patrick Mahomes. Again, if they win the Super Bowl, it's a very – goes hand in hand. But, uh, yeah, is I, I think – you know Jason don't, don't said that as well. Lamar Jackson out. Yeah, because, you know, I think it's going to be a quarterback, but it could be either of those two. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, sheesh. That's such a – those are all really good questions. We could sit and talk, you know, as we say in Hawaii, we could talk story for hours on that. Yeah, that's the issue. I, I, end, my, I end my interview with these five quick fire questions and I kind of realize I want to speak for hours on them, but oh well, maybe another time. <laughs> um, number four is a, it's a kind of two in one surprise package. Uh, so, surprise team, who you think is going to be a bit of a surprise this year, both team and player? Hmm. I think New England will surprise people that they won't have as big a fall as people anticipate they're going to have. Because I've heard people say that they're going to be a 4-12 and 12 team. I, I just – I can't see that. I don't – I think they're too well coached. They understand how to win enough. They've got a – you know, they, they're not a great roster, but they're good enough. They'll win games just because of the way they play football. Mm. Uh, in terms of a surprise team, you know, you saying bad team, team that goes, uh, to, goes south. No, nah, so someone that will um, basically surprise and do probably better than the people expect. But New England's one because I'm, I'm, I'm probably of the uh, in the majority that thinking they aren't doing so well. But then again, it's Belichick; they've got a good defense. So I kind of agree with you as well when you say that. So. Yeah, I, I think, and and again, in terms of a player that you know may jump out there. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see. I don't, I don't know if it's, if it'd be felt like in terms of uh, fantasy points or any of that other stuff, but I'm really, really curious to see what Emmanuel Sanders does in New Orleans because he's going to get targets because he's got Michael on the other side and Drew you know, I, I would pay money to watch them practice because I know what kind of, I've been on the field with both Drew Brees and uh, Emmanuel Sanders. And I don't know if you can find two better practice guys than those guys are. I mean, their practices will be fire. I'm just telling you. And to see what he's able to accomplish this late in his career, opposite of an, another great player, I think will be fun. Be two, uh, back, even though obviously he's lost the one with the Niners, but it could be back to back Super Bowls for Sanders, which would you know, it's interesting. Big... I think he will become the first. We were talking this, this the other day. I think he would become the first player to be at four Super Bowls with four different teams. That's, it. That's in, in, in itself what a credit to a player, like and, and to think now. To think, so this will tell you about how in, inexact the science it is. He was a two star recruit out of high school that had less than five offers and he was a I believe a third round draft pick by the Steelers so how many other receivers were picked up above him and now he's 11 years in the league and has 
will go to hopefully his fourth Super Bowl. I think it's a phenomenal story. Phenomenal story. Okay. So final one for you then, Jeff. Uh, you again, you just touched on it there, but fantasy points. So for the fantasy lovers out there, who is your top top pick up, top tip to get in fantasy? Aside from your obviously Christian McCaffrey, of course. Well, you know, obviously it's got to be a guy that scores touchdowns, right? Because that's, I guess, how you make the most of your fantasy points. Um, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see. I'm going to throw one at you, kind of a left field one, okay? okay? That my spies tell me that Todd Gurley's on a mission. And <laughs> if, uh, if he's healthy as he can be, with the way Quinn likes to, you know, I think that he, I think he could have a tremendous, tremendous year. And uh, again, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not, I mean, I don't know the guy, but I'm a big fan of his and I, you know, I, the way he handled it, what happened to him in, in uh, Los Angeles, I think I'm really hopeful that he has that kind of year. I mean, I'm so 50, 50 with this situation. I love Todd Gurley to pieces. I'd love him to go to Atlanta and just, absolutely be insane but then there's, there's part of me that wants the Rams to be right for cutting in but then yeah it's, it's, it's it's big year. you know it's interesting man you say that because you know I'm I'm an avid and avowed uh, Sean McVay fan but this is a big year for the Rams he's got his work cut out for him this is you got three new coordinators with you you got you know, um, they've still got some players on defense, but it's a whole new system they're going to put in. Um, real big question mark at running back and an offensive line that really took a took a step back last year. And I think with um, with Goff, he needs that running game. We've seen that when that when the running game's going good and he can play action and they can't get the linebackers to the immediate routes over the middle because Goff is a much better thrower inside the numbers right and yeah. so when they when they can run the football and go to play action and now the linebackers can't get depth and you know then you get cup on the over routes and woods on the over routes and that's the key to their offense to me and, and in order for that to happen they got to be able to run the ball jeff i would love to speak to about the los angeles Rams here for another three hours or so but uh, you're gonna get fed up and i need to go to bed soon so uh, <laughs> all right mate. thank you so much it's, it's been a blast me. i really enjoyed it very much thank you for asking me and and uh again we got to get you on coffee with the coach you got to come on one time and talk about your ramps